ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to welcome you this evening to Discourse Cafe, and tonight we are hosting Eleanor Craig Jr. Um, so I just want to explain the Discourse Cafe initiative and what it is um, by the Friedrich von Selslaube Institute for Student Leadership Development, and the Discourse Cafe is sponsored by the Konrad Arnau Stiftung, which is a German political foundation. So the idea behind the Discourse Cafe is to get prominent South African thought leaders to engage with students on a very informal setting, very personal, one-on-one. -on -one. So the size of the crowd is actually the ideal size in order for us to get some meaningful dialogue with Alan tonight. Um, I won't go into any further introductions. I'm sure Alan has a lot to say about yourself, about your story. So how it's going to work is Alan's going to speak. He's going to tell us a bit more about himself, um, where he's currently at, what his current projects are for the future, and then we'll have something to eat, and then we'll go into a question and answer session with the audience. So I'll give it up to Alan. So, um, thank you very much for the invitation. No um, as usual, I'm surprised to find this weird little place in the middle of the university. I've never actually been here. It seems like we quite a few startups in this, in this building. Mm -hmm. Are you guys all startups, or what is this? There's a couple of startups in there. Yeah, the rest? Academics? Yeah. No, we're not going to judge you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, we won't judge you guys. <laughs> um, so, I will uh, tell you a little bit about where I've come from and where I am right now. And uh, one of two lessons picked up along the way. And then, you know, I'll keep that as short as possible when you guys can ask questions. So it's better. Anybody have from Victoria? I no. studied there. No, you grew up there. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I grew up in Victoria, so I went to a school called the Glen High. It was a feeder school for Polesmore. The nice thing about um, <laughs> coming out of uh, Victoria is, you know, everywhere else in the world is awesome. So I can go live in Baghdad and I can go live in Afghanistan. I would be very happy. <laughs> I actually thought everywhere in the world lived in a Facebook house and um, or Tuscan. Those were the two options. But then I, uh, I ended up down in Stellenbosch. Uh, another reason uh, you've got to marry a girl from Stellenbosch because I'll end up living over here. <laughs> I went to, uh, I almost got expelled from school for taking booze to school. I mean, in my kind of school, if you almost get expelled, that means you did something pretty terrible. But I managed to get through school on, on, on uh, you know, on the deadline. And I got to university, I went to NMU. Anyone here at UDE, NMU? So I stayed at UDE, I was accounting. And I did, um, I managed to get through that without taking too many victory laps, no victory laps, so I got through in four years. And I went to Deloitte, in Cape Town, for articles, <laughs> in my life, got married at 25, we worked at Deloitte in New York for a little bit, and we traveled around the world, sold everything we had, a car, and uh, we got loans from Absa, Absa would give us a yeah, 50,000 million unsecured loan, stupid. But we each got one, and we, we poured that down the tubes doing a backpack around the world. We came back, and then we had to quickly figure out how we were going to make money. And I went to, and we went to Joburg, and that's kind of, I mean, that was probably the first chapter of my life, which was largely unconscious. I didn't really know what I was doing, and even if I didn't know what I was doing, I had no say in what I was doing. My dad said, this is what you're going to do, and, you know, you don't have to do it, but if you don't do it, you're on your own, good luck. So study accounting, or study anything you want. If you study accounting, I'll pay it. If you don't study accounting, you're on your own. And almost every decision was roughly that kind of binary result. But from 25 on, I could earn a bit of money for myself, so I started making decisions for myself. I would say that any upside I've had, any downside, but definitely any upside I've had since then has come from the fact that I purposely didn't do what my dad told me to do. And the reason for that is uh, my old boy and, I'm assuming, your parents loves me. And your parents are always going to tell you to take the low risk road. If they like you. If they don't love you, they don't love you. But if they love you, they're going to be careful. You know, they don't want you to lose money, they don't want you to have your heart broken. You know. So, you know, and from 25 onwards, you know, whenever I went into the business out there, I'm like, what do you think? He either said it was a great idea, and then I didn't do it. Or if you thought it was a terrible idea, I thought there must be a lot of risk there, so I kind of got on that road. And that's how I started my first business with Self Town. A guy uh, called Gavin Regis, who is allegedly part of the mafia, he um, approached me out of the room. There was a product from the, from the UK that wanted to track cell phones and blah blah blah. And uh, you know, I 
I've had a little business off the ground where we dealt with the telcos. I wanted to get into telecoms up. For some reason, MTM wouldn't hire me. But uh, Vodacom wasn't, uh, wasn't really an option for me. So I went to, uh, I managed to get into the game. And we, we let your, your hus husbands track wives, or wives track husbands, or parents track children. Or Back in 2003, so this was way before we had actually guessed their phones. So um, it's quite a fun business. It didn't, didn't do particularly well in the first two years. We were supposed to spend two million rand, we ended up spending eight and a half. I tried to pull the plug about almost two years in, I just said again, we're never going to turn the corner. Sorry, I don't want to you know, waste any more of your money. He, he backed me, he said, don't just believe in yourself. You know, we're big boys, we're all inside about the money. They never diluted me. and. Um, we ended up turning a corner and ended up with a business with like a million customers paying us 10 rand a month with uh, about 10 employees. And in 2007, one of my other shareholders, Blue Label Telecoms, listed and uh, rolled out all the minorities and paid me cash out. So I managed to, my first business, I made a lot of money at the top of the market. 2007 was the last big listing in South Africa. Literally, hasn't been another listing like that in six years. And um, I, I know that, and that was further confirmation that I'm a very best person other than my wife and children. And it's also a curse, because I thought this business thing is easy. <laughs> so I've started many businesses since then. I've done 21 businesses. Yeah. Some of them have done well, some of them haven't done very well. I also ran iBoost for a little bit. Basically, I was the chief operating officer, my official title was managing director. And I ran a little telco, and I kind of learned the hard way that it's very difficult <coughs> make some money in a data network with a broadband network if you don't have voice revenues to subsidize. Then I moved to Stellenbosch, um, and I'd say when I moved to Stellenbosch, that was the third phase of my life. And the, se the second chapter was semi-conscious. So I kind of roughly knew what was going on in the world, but I didn't really know. I was in the vortex of Joburg. You know, we were living the dream. My wife was, a, you know, the first year she paid the bills. But she was only like 50, 60 a month. And once I started making money, we started really living, you know, traveling and living the dream. And uh, we didn't have kids. Joburg's the high life. It was all about money, it wasn't about anything else. Money and fun. And then we moved down here to the top, we had our first child. Um, and I was a little bit you know, disappointed to be a little dorpy. You know, I thought, yeah, I put the family first. But, you know, quite quickly realized the best damn thing I've ever done in my life because I couldn't believe what was happening out there. It was just coming from a tech perspective. So I started World of Avatar. And the idea behind World of Avatar was finally I had my little epiphany. I, I woke up one day and I thought, Watch my child playing on an iPad or my iPhone, and it's really going to have every advantage in the world, but it's pulling away even further because of the digital advantage she has. So, how can I, how can I, you know, maybe kind of bridge that divide and at the same time make some money? Because you know, I'm not a charity cat, so I'm going to make a lot of money. And uh, I, mean, I don't know if any of you have been to America, anyone been to America? One thing I can tell you about America is generalization, there are exceptions, but they're mostly very stupid. And, um, and it's not because they IQ stupid, it's because they're arrogant. So there's a lot of <coughs> arrogance in America. Justifiably, they're the biggest economy in the world, they're the biggest companies. They've got everything you want, you don't have to leave America. You know? So when you go to Silicon Valley and you ask the guys, you know, what are you doing for a place like South Africa or Ghana or Nigeria, they look at you blank and they say, well, who's doing what do you have? You know, they just assume everyone's got an uncapped broadband, they assume everyone's got a credit card, and they assume everyone's got a smartphone. And it didn't matter how many times I tell these guys, look, they don't have that, so you have to find some alternative. They wouldn't change the way they were doing it. As far as they're concerned, the world would catch up tomorrow. So I thought, okay, well, this is a big fat tail, massive opportunity. Americans aren't looking at it. You don't want to go up against the rules of the world, but you're not going up against them, actually, because they're not looking at their opportunity. So I started Avatar, and the idea was smart apps for dumb phones. We would develop good stuff that was making money overseas, and just you know, dumb it down a bit for an environment with phones a little bit more limited in screen size. And with data is expensive, so it had to be thin on data. And that got a little bit carried away. I mean, it was supposed to be worse, supposed to be developing our own stuff, and we ended up investing and backing guys and, and a lot of <coughs> and then, I, and then I bought Mixit, um, which was a long convoluted deal, but uh, a lot of fun actually. And in many ways, made me, also broke me, but it made me at the time. Um, there's a book here, which we wrote just after I took it, which for me was uh, when, when I took Mixit. When we do the due diligence, I realized there's a lot more to mix it than Peter Fox. And, uh, and I thought, no one's ever told anybody about that. So I took the opportunity to write a book with Gus Silver. Whoever asked me the best question in the room, 
get the book. In case you want to know how the decision making process works, uh, it works on my discretion. <laughs> and I must just say, one of the reasons you want to have your own business is because you get to say the way things are going to be. There's no committee. You take a hell of a lot of financial risk and other risk, but you get to make every decision. So on that call about who makes, makes the best question, like the best question to look at. And um, we've got Mixit. I'm going to run Mixit for a year. And then I came really fast because I had a massive fallout with my partners at Mixit and I ended up getting kicked out of the business. Basically, business is like marriage. Your shareholders are your wife and husband, and if you fight and you start fighting, you know, if, if you're not careful, you'll destroy your house and your kids. So when you get divorced, you've also got to divide those things up. And in this particular instance, they kept the house and they kept the kids. So I hopped onto a, a plane, I needed to get the hell out of and, uh, China Town, or whatever it's saying. Dodge. Dodge. Dodge 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 Town. You need to get out of Dodge. Get out of Dodge. Yeah. So I got out of Dodge, and uh, I just waited for a visa for my little baby. She, so she didn't even know the US visa, and we, we flew to um, the States. We got on a big RV, one of those big camping vans. Push a button on the sides, light up, there's a kitchen, there's a shower. Most amazing thing, I can hardly wait for And we drove to America for about almost two months, for about 15,000 miles. Cleared my head, came back to the SA. I actually did consider maybe just going there for a little bit of working, getting some experience, rebuilding my confidence in my capital. And I came back saying, what the fuck was I thinking? SA is the place to be. This is the land of opportunity. I actually think I was onto something. I might not have executed it as well as I could. But um, I'm going to try it again. Which brings me to, uh, I guess, chapter, the next chapter. Uh, you know, I mean, that was a pretty conscious chapter for me. Like, there were parts of it that were. I think I was trying to make a difference. You know, I think actually anybody today who's not, you know, who's not, um, trying to make money but at the same time help people is probably working for an investment bank. And um, I think that was a good part of that. Part of that. I mean, I'll never regret how it went because I know I was doing things for the right reason. But it wasn't a success. Because if you want to be a success in business, you need to make money. And if you've got partners, you need to make money for them. So this is the next chapter and, uh, and now I'm in a... I uh, started a side project about a year ago. Where we wanted to take over this, the cinema should be wife out. When I was running Mexico, we did a deal with the space team. We showed them how they could roll out free Wi-Fi in the townships. We also did it with the bar, but the main idea was kind of only in the space. And then when I left, one of those, those were one of the things I couldn't reach. You know, my partners and I couldn't see eye to eye on that need for that type of thing. So it became an orphan. It's kind of fizzled out. It felt like it was, I mean, it was a bit of a wasted kill it. So I tried to adopt it. So I set up a, a non-profit entity called Project de Cizue. And we would take it over, and the idea was rich people would give us donations and we'd roll out be Wi-Fi for poor people. It didn't work out exactly as I intended. For one thing, we couldn't take over the Settlers project. It's a, it's a very political council at the moment, so no one's making decisions. We tried to approach the city of Cape Town, but don't ask them what a good job they did, because they'll tell you. And uh, if there's one thing I learned, um, excuse me, to the goal, but if there's one thing I learned from, um, from trying to find a wife, or a girlfriend, or anything, is that the sure way to go home at night alone was to uh, you know go for the best looking girl in the room. At least that can work for me. So yeah. <laughs> I, I adopted the go ugly early strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like okay, you know, probably the ugliest girl in the room is Karting from mm -hmm. a national election perspective, but everyone's the battleground state. So I, I you know I, I, I hired some partners at the Daily Maverick and they got me an introduction into Karting and C ANC and Karting. In Trani, and next thing you know, we had a whole project where we were rolling out free wi on the townships in Trani, in Victoria. And the next thing you know, we're right now we're sitting on a 153 million rand contract to roll out free wi for 3 million people this time next year. It's a rocket. We've just been awarded a tender by the Western Cape government to roll out free wi fi in Atlantis and Robertson. Of course, it's not free, someone's paying. The consumer's not paying, the man on the street's not paying, but the government's paying. Just like water and electricity, it's a subsidized basic service for the best fortune. And that's a lacquer rocket. And uh, right now I'm kind of, I think I've spotted another business opportunity. So I'm trying to raise a bit of money so I can run with that. And um, I did that this morning in Joey, when I came back to South and had another pitch this afternoon, kind of selling much. Yeah, I'm selling, selling, selling the dream. Mm -hmm. I need that money so I can hire somebody to run with it because for me at least Project to Seize is one of those once in a lifetime opportunities to do something really big on a, on a grand scale and learn something new. 
So that's where I am today. Um, I can't say I'm a billionaire. I wish I could say I'm that. I, can, I can't say I've uh, got any tips on how to make a business success, but I can give you a lot of tips on how to, how to fail. <laughs> I can tell you how to, you know, what mistakes we made along the way. And I can also tell you that um, no matter what I tell you, Max, you have to ignore everything. I mean, you can listen, but you've got to ignore it. Because, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to go down a path and it tends to be a dead end, you don't want to, have, you know, you don't want to hit that dead end and find out, you know, and you take directions from somebody else. You know, because it's your dead end. And you've got to find your own path. You know, and you can't point fingers and say, he told me this or that, so please take everything I say with a pinch of salt. I can be a little bit extreme on both sides. On that note, I'm, I'm open to questions. I think we can grab a snack and then we can do it. Okay. Are we ready with any questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay, you can just go for it. Uh, which sector, which sector uh, technology would you like to see as a possible booming uh, sector for investment in the future? Military. Military. I'd say, the only thing I'm really interested in is technology. So, like tech. Tech or telecom or I mean, uh, TMT, telecom media and technology. But the, um, if you look at the world today, there's direct correlation between defense spend and technology use. Israel, China, America. They all spend the most on the military, and they all got leading tech companies. In America's um, research, you know, from the 50s after when the Cold War started, wars in San Francisco. There's no coincidence that that's where HP and all these guys came out of. And the web companies, because that's where DARPA started. And in South Africa, guess where the military was? Victoria, so much. Where the tech clusters? Victoria, so much. Israel, obviously. China, on top of a closed market, they've got a um, strong military spend. So, you know, if, if the government actually started pumping money into the military, you would see a big overflow in lots of different industries, not just tech. And it would be a nice subsidy. It's actually a subsidy that the world gives their the various industries, and we don't get it. And not only is it a subsidy, but it's also good for the country. And when we drove through America, I mean, I never would have said this before that American trip, but when we drove through, and you drive through the South, we were going to the South, right? Where if you get divorced, you're still right in the system. <laughs> and these are like, they're like billboards out there. Like helicopters, and like GIs jumping on, and Marines, and the core, and everything's like hardcore military. Right? They, and these guys walk around, and they're proper, and they're, and they're Check these guys training on the beach in San Diego, that's where the Pacific beach is faced. I mean, it's far away. Choppers and jets. And, and you can see there's a percentage of the population of every country that was meant to go that way. It's just what it was, you know? They were meant to go that way. And the army gives them like a sense of duty and it gives them and it takes a, an element out of society that actually could be quite a scary element. And it gives them an honor code and I think it's good for society and it's good for the citizens. Like you get part of, I, I used to get like gooses looking at these things. I mean, I'm not even American. So it's, like, it's almost like sport, you know, you're not sure what the return on investment is, but there's something to be said for the country. And I think the overspool from defense spend into tech especially is massive. And that's, that's basically the subsidy you need to uh, like boost the, the local industry. Okay. You, you spoke about um, sort of all the, or sort of the mental fact that you've made a lot of, a lot of mistakes. What mistake, yeah, what mistake have you enjoyed most in, in, in making? And that uh, was Sarah. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. What's your, what's your idea? No, but, uh, no, but in terms of, in terms of, um, in terms of, sort of the business, uh, your business ventures, uh, we, uh, that was a complete and utter screw up, but it was, I, I'm really glad I did it. Uh, look, I mean, I can't say, it's like girls, right? They're all different. And guys. <laughs> 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 
they um, I'd say the the flops, well the business flops are there. Where I've got three business flops. Basically three things to sell by. Ibis was a not a wild success, not a great failure either, it was just mediocre. Was, when I left it definitely just tailed off a bit, yeah. <coughs> but I really enjoyed the prospect because there we built an army of people that were going to war. 250 employees, best company to work for South Africa for technology. We paid 50% less than the market. The people would die for you. It was an amazing culture. That's where I learned about morale and culture. And, you know, it was amazing. I really enjoyed that. And then still, and those are the people that have moved, sold their houses, put their jobs, brought their families down from Joburg to so much to come help me do this. Be right, And the next one is Avatar, which, you know, while it's very sexy and a lot of hype and a lot of fun, it's definitely not a, not a success. Um, in my terms, at least. It was a success in many ways, but financially it wasn't a success for me. And, uh, but I learned about it. I mean, I've mostly learned that's all the load of bullshit. All this tech startup stuff. Build it and they will come. Users are have value. Users only have value if your next to neighbor is Google or Apple. That's what it is about. If you're WhatsApp and you're in the office building next to Google, and Apple knows they don't buy you, or you know, Facebook do not buy you, Google's going to buy you. That's the only time in the world. So it's basically one time in America where those rules apply. Everyone else in the world will not apply. So it taught me plenty of lessons like that. Um, taught me about the type of people to look for to run a business. Taught me what I'm not good at. And what I'm not good at is being an investor. I like being hands on. Running the show. Yeah. I like it. It's my thing, it's my sales and it's my product. Which brings me to my third, then it's a flop, which is mixed. And then I finally had something in the game under my control, and then a bit of an army, 150 employees, and a good go dressed. And uh, you know, I don't think I had to live it. The good thing. So I had a lot of fun, learned a lot. Learned a lot about myself and about other people. At the end of the day, it was the most painful moment of my life, and I thought, I mean, that's, that's a good thing, right? If that's the most painful thing I've ever to you, you get kicked out. But uh, it wasn't that kind of thing, but... Alright, it's a lot, a lot. I still trust people. I need to trust people, I'll be okay. So don't, you know, when Paul comes to you and asks you to sign an NDA before he tells you his idea, that's not a good sign. When somebody comes and asks you for an NDA, the value of your idea uh, is inversely proportionate to the to the, the secrecy. Mm -hmm. But Paul, by the way, does it in good ideas. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, I actually wanted to ask, just on the scientific concept, but um, government contracts with me, um, with those guys, I, I, I assume it's your, your project, you're the majority stakeholder um, for the simple that's uh, well, it's not a company. It's a non-profit. Is it? So it's a non-profit. It's not uh, the PE points are not shareholders. It's beneficiaries. Oh, okay. Beneficiaries are the like the communities that are black. Basically. So okay. so we just ticked all those boxes. It was accidental. It was completely accidental. I mean, we did it. We wanted to give a rich person a donation system to get a tax deduction. It was a million rand or three Wi Fi to power or something like that. But um, in the end, the beautiful thing of the whole thing is we can deal with the council without having to go through the government rules. Firstly, because there's no EU requirement, we automatically take that box. And secondly, an issue something called a section, section 67 grant to an NGO, which means they don't have to tender, provided it's clearly good value for money. And we price it at 15 cents a week. I mean, 3D is one round of there, so we're doing it like 6,000 times cheaper. And we're doing, um, and it's clearly within their strategy. Like their, the city's strategy is education, jobs, access to information, and so it does all that stuff. And it was, surprising, it was a surprisingly pleasant experience um, to deal with um, the city of Toronto in particular. Very, very impressive political leadership. The kind of guys I wouldn't mind to run the country, but I'd follow them. I'd follow the man, as person, and I wouldn't have said that before I started dealing with him. I wouldn't have said that about any leader I can see. And the city manager, etc., were are, um, is that going against me? Yeah. I don't want to edit out that part so that Jay-Z doesn't 
I'm joking, Jesse. Are there any the management of the, you know, the every city, everything in the country is divided between politicians and, and civil servants, and you need to win them both. Up. So we won, uh, you know, with the bar of the mayor and the council, and with the bar of the civil service, who won't come all into it. But then you need their competence as well. If they're not competent, it doesn't matter how much they, what they want to do. Like, you know. And in 20, again, we were amazing. It is an amazingly pleasant experience dealing with that. Professional, they pay their bills on time. Everything happens quickly. When we rolled out a 25,000 capacity network in six weeks, and we needed them for everything. We needed them to plug in electricity, we needed them to close the roads, to put up fiber, we needed, we needed them. And it happened. So I think in, in certain pockets in South Africa, it's actually very nice. What, what does it cost uh, on, on broadband and the energy on, on those kind of? 15 cents. It doesn't sound There's like nothing. There's no profit. But part of the reason we get it down so cheap is the first reason is we cut out all these middlemen like die data, BCX and stuff. So we just go straight to a nice internet search driver. You know, like it's, it's still much like an Avalon or a Wish, uh, Snowball or a Wish or something. Um, and over there is a brand called Bromberg. So they do things very frequently. Um, secondly, we, we, we use very cheap equipment. We bring it all in from America. You know, in the old days, a Wi-Fi base station was set you back off in America. Now you can get something from America for a thousand pounds. So there's an order of magnitude drop in capital costs. We get some bandwidth, uh, really good discounted bandwidth from the airtime. But actually, if you think about the economics of the whole thing, I think <coughs> other than us not taking a margin to putting taking it off the table, uh, the city. You know, if you can use the city's buildings and the city's electricity. You've saved a lot of cost. I mean, Vodacom's got 5,500 base stations in the country. Your average rent per base station is about 10,000 rand a month. And then you've got EDI approvals, you've got to sign a side of lease agreement, you've got to get electricity, you've got to do everything. When you're working with the government, they've got everything. They own everything. They own every water tower, they own everything. You actually you can't leave on much to own until you've dealt with them. And you, if you don't have to pay them rent and get permissions and sign lease agreements and get the electricity plugged in because they've got electricity, then uh, you're well on your way to getting a really low cost venture fund. And that's why it works. It's actually pretty cool model. Um, post uh, the mixed fiasco, have you found that when trying to raise funds for new ideas, that the South African investors in general ignore what's hyped up in the media and actually look at you kind of credibly again, or do you have to convince them from scratch, actually, you know, mixed wasn't all my fault? You know, admit some mistakes and then actually say, there's something real in this news that I, um, How have you found the response? Well, the response has been pretty good. Okay. But the um, first thing is, I always say it was all my fault. Because okay. it was all my fault. Whether it was or wasn't, it doesn't matter. You have to take responsibility for everything that happened in your life, so it was all my fault. And anybody who's got a problem with me saying it was all my fault is not the kind of mess up. Actually, I want to invest in people that say that. I don't want to have a guy talking about this, if that, you know. Um, there's a great line when it comes to bad press. If you make it that day, you're going to get bad press, because that's what happens. People who matter don't care. People who care don't matter. And that's how I think about it. Anybody who's got some issue with me being in a paper about something like that, mm. it, it just doesn't matter. And the people who do matter, been through all of those movies before, they've got perspective on them, and they just can't keep what they read. Until they meet you. I mean, you've got to sell yourself, and then if you're, if you're a dick, then you're a dick. Mm. No one's going to invest in you. If they're a dick, and you're not a dick, no, they're invested in you. No, it's got to be like the same people. So you've got to be yourself. You know, that's not a big question, but uh, something to the effect. I, I thought initially that the first brand innovative, uh, you know, let's think new, not that article, freshness, and the Alan Not Craig's exactly the sameness would be a, a good mix, a very good, a good mix to work together. Uh, just give us an idea of, of what some of the differences were and why you decided that uh, you go your way, and if people don't accept it, then perhaps they should find it. What's me to leave? What do we do? Well, we reached a mutual agreement. They told me to fuck with us. Uh, you know, firstly, they're very good people. I was partners up with 
the whole first round like that. It was just too simple. But the um, the very good people, the, they looked after me in the end, and they could have been much, much worse. You know. um, but there yeah. is a, you know, a similarity, at least a culture similarity. <coughs> No, I think, I think, you know, I, I actually, I definitely differ in some massive ways around how I think about it. Business people, they do, actually. So, I mean, we've got the same skin color, we've got the same jokes, but we're not the same people. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. There's nothing wrong with not being the same people. Just don't marry people that aren't the same people. You can be friends with them. Don't marry them. They're all in, like, the Lord of the Roses, you're awesome. They're like it. Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner barricade themselves in the house and fight each other to the death and eventually die. Because that's what happened in a bad marriage. So rather than that, we just called it quits. Right? Um, so I don't know, look, they've got all the money, right? So until you've got the money, go right. Simple as that. I mean, from my perspective, not just about money, but money is a scorecard. And to be successful in business, you make money. Until I can say I'm even close to that, as far as I'm concerned, I was wrong, they were right. We'll see. But I, well, I came back from America confident again in how I want to do things. I might be stupid, or maybe not, but I'm going to do carry on my business whilst I've still got money. And I'm sure we've run out of money, so you know, maybe, maybe I'll have to get a job again one day. Which is very difficult once you become unemployable, like me. Um, just, just, just a quick question about your thought process when you went to America. Obviously, um, you were quite accomplished at the time already. Um, before you went to mix up, mix up was the Oscar. And um, and you, you left I'm mean, like two months away to so it's great, but what did you thought process to come back again? Um, where were you, where to where was your head at? Um, how did you think through it to come back again and do the project which I think we're looking I mean we have to come back. Yeah. <laughs> No, but, well, just like staying in America, that's like, no, but into business or rather into the technology space again. Yeah. No, I came back and my wife and I went back in two weeks without the kids and we stayed with some friends. Actually, the guy I started opera and some guys in San Francisco. So we really looked around and spoke to a lot of people. And that was more kind of serious. And the um, whole process is, this is how I want to come on with it. This is where the opportunity is. There's no opportunity in America. There's inflation in America. So people are doing quite the gap between the rich and poor is being bigger. If you're rich, you're making a lot more money. If you're not rich, you're not making money. So there's more opportunity there. There's less competition there. Even. The doorstep of a booming, booming economy. It's, it's, the, it's the India, China of the next decade. You know? It's just what it is. So that's, that's the logic. Why the hell I went there is because <coughs> it is pretty damn rational what I went through. You know? For me, it is. I was a challenge, but it really felt pretty hectic for me. I thought people were following me. I used to like look at my rear view mirror and fuck someone's following me. I think I'm pretty apparent. You know? And uh, you just have to get out. You can't talk to people when you're in that state. Because you're going to say something and you're going to regret. And that's the one thing I'm so grateful for. Because I would have said a lot of things I would have regretted if I'd been around and spoken to the media or you and this got on the internet. I would have said other things which are not necessarily true, but in the heat of the moment you just get carried away. So it's the best thing. I can hire you. You break up with a girl or a guy and your heart's broken. You have a fallout in your business. Whatever setback you have, just get the hell out of Dodge City. Dodge City, not Dodge. Just say it. Tomatoes and what? So following you on Twitter, it seems that you read widely and you read a lot. And um, I'm assuming by now you've kind of formed a, a worldview. And uh, how does, what is that? And how does that impact the way you do business? That's a pretty fucking weird question. But it's a run out for the book. No, I, mean, I just, I do read a lot. And I can tell you, that's one thing I'm grateful to my parents for. They, they gave me the love of reading. You know? I love reading. And then I can't wait to read. I'm reading a book a day. Every day. And I've been doing that for 12, 13 years. You start doing that, you start pulling away from the crowd. You know? But you've got, to, you've got to practice reading to like learn how to speed read and those things. My worldview is this. <clears throat> the world keeps getting better. Every day it keeps getting better. Everybody who works for a newspaper, who's mostly working for a newspaper because they can't get a job anywhere else in the world, thinks the world's fucked. So if you want to be happy, don't read newspapers. Or watch TV. It's just violence. It's just entertainment. It's like Oscar destroys. It's just meaningless. It's not the world. 
it's a little snapshot of something that gets your attention. So I think the world's going to be better every day. I think the internet's revolutionising the world. So I don't care about Russia. 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 Who can sit at the very top? Who's so I think I think like World War III might be around the corner, but I, I think losing to the Aussies at home is far worse. It's not going to happen. World War III is not going to happen. China's probably going to take Taiwan. No, it's going to drop a bomb. Carry on, carry on. Who's on the wrong side? I know that. That's a guarantee. That's a fact. It's, like, it's like a retarded. What he's doing. But it's not okay, so we know how that movie ends. People rise up to this day of the police. Bereton, Bereton was not a savage. I think it was a lack of belief in anything. But it's a global problem. The only exception of politics we use seems to be capitalism at a very world level. This is, you know, it's a little good good, you've got Boris Johnson, you've got Trotty, but some days in the world are actually really standing out to be as a living thing. Mediocrity at the top. He's just. You know, what's this? I'm Jersey. Mr. James Jones. He is. <laughs> I actually like the guy. I'm not saying he's the best guy to run our country. But I, I think it could be worse. <laughs> <laughs>
Das ist so, dass es so ist. Das ist so, dass man sich nach der Gelegenheit nicht mehr sieht. So. So. Oder das ist eigentlich nicht mehr gesagt. Nein, ich sehe mir nicht so sagen. So liebe ich vor und nicht so. Da bin ich nicht so gut gefahren. En dat is het echt, omdat je het hier wil, dat je wat je kan en wat je hebt, en dat moet je hebben om alles anders te doen. Dus ik vind dat je het niet kunt zeggen, je kunt het niet kunnen 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 zeggen, Lucy is taking much deeper. So if he needs to impress the school or a guy, or this is an opportunity or a job, you've got to go for it. You've got to put that in your hands to share about it. If you're not, it's a second effect of life. It can't be taken. Alex, you're talking about the going back to your phone. What are you talking about the future of smartphones? And then it's one of those last years. And then it's going to become a commodity. And then we want a TV screen on the table. But how soon? So I saw for high sense. Right? So high sense started making smartphones. What a fucking terrible brain. Mm -hmm. Who wants a high? I mean, what does this say? When I put this phone on the table, it says I've got money. Apparently, it's six percent more likely to come right than an Android. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm more than an Android. So what does that say? Their phones are better. The only reason it says that is because Apple makes the best product in the world. Depends on your products. On, on the <laughs> <laughs> At least in terms of price, it's the most expensive. So it's the most expensive product, people are willing to pay for it, so that means you've got money, right? No one with an iPhone does that way. So cigarettes were the same long ago. There was a time where you know, the guy made the best cigarette sold the most cigarettes and could charge the most for it. And then one day, you could, anybody could make cigarettes. And a guy from London who fit in this little town opened the cigarette business in his garage. And he realized that it doesn't matter what's in the box. It only matters what's on the outside of the box. Because when you put that cigarette box on the table, it says something about you. It says Peter Stuyvesant. It says Rothman. It says Gunston. He made all those brands. He invented those brands. From this little door, we have all those globally empowered brands with a piece of shit commodity behind it. actually killed each other. So maybe these things also be in the lab. But it didn't matter what was inside the box. The tech. The cigarette was the commodity. The brand was more important. And I think that's the way the phone. The phone, they're just going to level the playing field. And I promise you, I don't want Samsung on the table. What does Samsung say about you? It says you fucking like kitchen appliances. <laughs> 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 Boom. Like, that's cigarettes. That was food, like, it would become very popular. How soon do you think that will happen with smartphones in Africa? These smartphones, four years. In four years, there'll be another smartphone that will cost 10,000 rand and there won't be that. I mean, when I say that, there's always going to be an age of technology that's far in the region of that. But today's smartphone is called Max. 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 But even then, I still need to make a closer type of conversation. For instance, like meeting someone. Yeah. It's a better dating type of thing. You can't meet to get a class, you can meet to stay in the mix. Um so I don't know what the future is. I think uh, I think it's an amazing opportunity. It's far and away only biggest and only application of any substance is definitely on the way. And then I guess it doesn't matter, so I guess it's a top talker. It's a foreign company, that ninety percent market share. So, you know, for a tech startup, it's the only real light. It's, it's important. It's important that it doesn't work. And uh, one of the other guys there, they do cut. So I think um, I'm on that. You, you stated that uh, sort of you, you really want to make a bucket of money. And, uh, well, but <coughs> when you're devoting basically all of your time, you've talked about strapping yourself to the rocket and you said, what did you see there? Um, how do you justify that considering the annual sales market? It's about so, leaving destiny. It's like a pause point. And you're when you swing along, laughs are removed, you swing along, you swing along. And you think you want to go over there, 
the time keeps pulling in the and you can't live with the time diminishing is a And as many as you think it's the flow of the So it's not what I want to do. I want to go back to my uh, part of it. I also want to help you. I thought I'd have to make money before I can help people. Right now, I'm helping people, I don't need to make the money first. I'm being better, second. It's not being at all. So, um, that's the short answer. Like, in the end, I just stop fighting the river, and I'm committed to a season, and I'm going to try and make the most of it. We could sort of be a shack, but I think it's worth having some to us, and I'm good. And I've got to have passive investments on the side where I can make money. So, we're going to invest money in the JSC, we're going to invest money in startups. That's where I can make money. So, did you say you'll make most of your money from ads? Mm -hmm. uh, did you say that earlier? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Because I don't know how. Uh, I don't want to make any money from ads. <coughs> no. In the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. But don't put side of business trying to sell ads. You're 75, you've made 10 million rand, you've got any cash, what do you do with the last 10 years of your life? <coughs> well, firstly, I'll have another 25 at least. Okay, 25 is more. Uh, and I'll probably be working. Mm -hmm. So, when you go that much money, what, what is it? No, I'm not working for money, it's a scorecard. I'm working because I enjoy working. I mean, I, I don't work, I haven't worked in 12 years. The last time I worked was at Deloitte. Since then, it's been the most fun I've ever had in my life. I mean, there's been stressful times and ups and downs, but it's fucking a job. I mean, I get up in the morning, can't wait. Can't wait for it. Like, this is my smartest I've wear. This is a pitch. I'm trying to get people to give me millions of rounds. Mm -hmm. There's baddies and bare feet. So I'm living the dream. And uh, I want to be in baggies and barefoot thing. I don't know, you know, you don't need a lot of money to, to live a good life. There's only so much coffee in the world. And there's only so many dollars you can take on, travel to every country in the world. And uh, so as my kids go to high school. So I'm not speaking with you last time, talking about what is that one problem that you want, we want to pick on? Teleportation. Teleportation. That's the same time it is. I don't need to stop in the world for a reason. I can't leave and get out of the house of the day. And then it's the last of the day. Because there's no such beautiful questions for me. Is it easy? Of course it's easy. I don't know what it is. I'm a cop, but I'm not. I have a question. I'm a super black person, but it's going anyway. Um, how did you get from accounting to telecommunications? Um, well, I must have been my step. My dad started both. Um, so my dinner table conversation was always telecoms. I knew telecoms well. My old boy was a electric, electrical engineer at Stanford, at the university. Mm -hmm. He went to the post office anniversary. He used to keep the trenches and all the later ones. And he works his way up. Um, and the post office split from Telcom in the 80s when he was on the Telcom side. And he actually told me when he was like 36 and he was a part of fucking commit suicide. I mean, he was so depressed. He had three boys, he had a mortgage, he had like everything. And he was going over. He's like so deep. Sitting in an Afrikaans national barrister. And, and he wasn't going to see And uh, one day I walked into the office and said, I want to do that research is so that's 89. He did even travel the world for two years, researched all our friends in the world, came back, wrote the white paper to the government, presented in Parliament, argued that they had Chris Becker actually. Chris was arguing for the American standard, which died five years later. And all men argued for GSM, the only million customers in the world. And, um, and then told them that what issue of the licenses, 50% of one of the licenses, and they were to appoint the CEO. And they offered it all the uh, offer contracts, you know, being bets and target vendors and that. And they were like, no, it's all things that are So he's like, me, me, pick me. And they eventually are. So he never had a share in his life in Vodacom. He was an employee his whole life, he paid a salary to bonus. But I learned telecoms from him. I love that stuff. I really love it. And he, um, and he taught me some lessons. He taught me not to put work before family, to put divorce. That's because work came first. He taught me control your own destiny or you have a heart attack. He had two heart attacks. It was so fucking stressful keeping his job. Because everyone's, you know, it's all this boredom politics and stuff. And um, you'll never get rich, really rich, unless you have it. In other words, you'll never have financial independence. You'll never be free to do whatever you want to do unless you have it. So you have to do, you have to do your own thing. If you really want to be free, and I really want to be free, you've got to do that. Um, <clears throat> so what about leaving your job and going to the competition? What do you mean? 
from Oregon to Sochi. I don't, uh, you confusing me with my father. Now, last year you said about the lessons that you learned from him. Oh, from him? Mm. Okay, so why did he do that? I don't know, you know, he was a bit bored, he was retired. My old man retired from Oregon when he recently joined South Sea, but he was going to have a stroke, you know, mm. so he's been out of action for a couple of months. But uh, he, uh, when he was a bit bored, I think the, the money didn't hurt. And I think he was like, fuck you guys. You know? The moment he walked out the door, he gave them his life. You know? They gave him money, but he, I mean, he put a lot in. And they forgot his phone, you know? they lost it. And then they went there for him, and maybe he needed him. So I think it was a bit of 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 Nothing faces him. Nothing. And his affection is so don't have a process, but he can't hurt his anger. He can't hurt it. Can't hurt it. Can't hurt it. Like, oh, process. Okay. I'm just trying to pass the sign. Okay. Oh, okay. So now I'll just turn on you. Know, so you can do it. Like, it's a very really powerful energy. When you're in a position of. When you have that. I don't know if I can do it. I think in that sense, it's a very dangerous style of energy. Yeah. 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 Because he's sitting there, he's like a two year old with a bazooka in the playroom, he's fucking shooting at one. Before you left, it said you were opening up a platform for extensions and other workers. Is that going on? I think it's there for a variety. Do you think that's the way forward? To make your crowd fund or crowd wizards? I think the future is like South Africa. <coughs> the future of the social media is all these apps is like a country like South Africa. It's not free market and it's not communist. Right? It's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. There are some important industries you need to control and subsidize and <coughs> make a profit on. And there's some industries that must leave the market. Like banking is not something you just let anybody run a bank. Um, so it makes it, and I think we might have, we bounced it a bit around when I was there. You know, we were sitting down in this kind of hybrid model in the end. Fundamentally, the more people swimming in your direction, the more likely you are to reach the other side of the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have an ecosystem where you can make money out of your platform. You can start swimming in your direction, and you know, do everything they can do if you want to make it, but they don't make money. So, if you don't do that, it doesn't make sense. It's kind of a lot of bit of capital you said to get it on market um, working. Yeah, well, not really. It makes it sad. The audience is there. It's all the time. I think the main problem is that the audience is relatively poor. So they don't know how to start this one. And it's a typical life in my life. Three books that everyone wants to finish to read. Got to read this new book by Ben Horowitz called like, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Got to read Anthony Rick's book. Sorry, okay. This is my brother in law, Donald's brother in and I said, he's like, it's a shame. Very easy to do. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's a good one. When you have a, a new idea for a startup um, and you're looking for investors, how do you negotiate equity and money? Um, Maybe just to add on to that, venture capital, what is your view on venture capital? Well, let me start with the second question. There is no venture capital in South Africa. There's mainly three guys who are good. One of them is very good, professional, poor guy. But in general, I don't think they are. That's, that's, I don't even want to go back on that. It's like, because there's no ecosystem. There's no one for the VC to sell to and sell to and sell to. In America, there's all these layers and they all exit to each other. And like, so I've got a big Ponzi scheme. And the health of the consumer is the man on the street buying those big shoes. But, um, Say that, uh, how do you raise money? Well, how, do you, how do you pick up a dog? You got a dog? Oh, that's what I'm asking. All the dogs are I'm going to tell you about the secret of picking up a dog. The secret of picking up a dog is you can't think that you want it. You just got to be able to see. So, unless you want to get the really ugly investor, like the dodgy you know, guy who's going to go to jail. The guys you want are used to being hunted down, just like the other one, for money. Right? So when somebody ignores them, they get interested. 
So if they can see you and know about you, but you still haven't come to them for money, they start thinking, why is this guy not coming to me for money? That's now you have a gap. Get that guy to call you. Once he's given you a call, he's decided to invest, just don't fuck that up. And then it's like, tell them about the market opportunity. There's, there's blogs on this, there's hundreds of things in there. Size of market, how you're going to make money, you know, why are you going to do it and nobody else can do it, why we can trust you. But at, at 90% of the game is before you do the pitch. Which basically means you have to be visible and you have to call the archer. Would it be the ideal agreement on which shares that you would like? Uh, I did even want to give away zero to you and raise 100 million. But realistically, I did. Well, I'd say the first little thing you want to do is a very small amount of 10%. Very difficult to do in South Africa because there's no appetite for this type of thing and guys negotiate to over equity. Because there's no competition, so I want you. You give you 100,000 rand and I want 50%. You know, it's just not going to work. Ideally, you'd like enough money to get you through six months to a point where you know you've got a product which you can sell much more at a much higher valuation. So your first 10% and you sell another, say, 20%. And you're at a higher value, that gets you for the next 18 months. That's how America works, and I understand that now. You know, it's important to do these small tranches and uh, slightly like 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 minimum viable business. Get to the, and then raise the money as you go rather than try to raise the first more than the first time. Because if you pay you won't, you need to be able to raise the But the first people you always go with money are family, friends, and friends. Always. That's how everybody has actually started with business. I mean, I don't know any exceptions to that. Some people don't tell you that because they're trying to pretend they're fucking heroes. But everybody started like that. They either went to their dad or their mom or their uncle or brother or something, <coughs> borrowed like, off a bar or something. Well, they had some very, very close and trusting people. So, that's why I don't And all you find is that For the most part, it's the same thing. And then that gives you the traction that you need in order to get to a point where you can sell a story to a professional investor. Mm -hmm. Have you got a mentor or a, or a coach? Or if you don't have, what would you like to have? Um, yeah, I've got, I've got a few. I've been very lucky in that way as well. Uh, I was in my old man. And I'm a prime notorious. He picked me out of a good one there. And I've got um, Jane Raffaelli. She started a session magazine. So I'd call them my mentors. They seem to have a soft spot for them. And they're always, they're always ready to provide good moral support. But um, the guy I would love to have got to know is Steve Jobs. I really admire that guy. I quite like Larry Ellison as well, actually. He's real good. But I like guys that are Yeah, at least you know they're dicks. The guys that always look so clean and squeaky clean, those are real. Those are guys you've got to worry about. So. Um, and so I would have loved to have met Andrew Rupert. I think he was just an amazing guy, a very humble guy. Who in, who in the world today? I don't know. There's a guy, uh, the guy who's founded and is running the OH. He's pretty good. But a lot of respect for when you know, it's, it's, it's a big listed company in the IT space. It's probably at the moment by my favorite. And there's a lot to choose from this time. Uh, uh, you know, I've decided to school and stuff. And then like, you go to university and you start knowing everything about the world, so I stopped believing in God. And then I got out of university and I started realizing how fucking random everything in the world was and how lucky I'd been and I started thinking, okay, maybe there's God. So I still say my first year out. So I don't go to church. And um, I'm not like, quite religious, religious first so I start to meet with prayers. But I, I subscribe to Blaise Pascal's theory, who's a famous mathematician, mm -hmm. called Pascal's Wager. I'm going to Google it. Mm -hmm. But that's fundamentally why I do it. It's just the odds game. It's better to be in God than not to, just in case you die, there is a God. But just kidding. Please go search here. Steve, one last question. Mm -hmm. I was going to give those books to that girl in Vietnam. Oh, Max, I'm going to see you. Are you going to? Oh. That, that's a good question. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your time, guys. It's been very sorry for a bit low on the energy. I've been waking up at 3 in the morning every day for like two weeks now. <laughs> and it's like getting, getting to me. So, tomorrow is my last day of the fundraise. Please wish me well. I should get 5 million rand by then tomorrow. If I don't, well, life goes on. I'll start again next week. And 
ਮੈਨੂੰ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਬਸ ਚੋਂ ਵੀ ਲੈ